Welcome, my friends. It is Wednesday, and I'm Mary Rose Wood. And Wednesday is when I go live in my Facebook group and on my YouTube channel to talk with you, storytellers, about good storytelling and good writing craft. So, welcome back to those of you who are regulars. And I got to tell you right away, I am super stoked to see that Rosalind has answered the call. She's accepted the call to adventure to be here today. If you don't know what I'm talking about, hang on, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. Why do the heroes of our books sometimes really desperately need an adventure or change, and yet they're not that quick to say yes to it? And importantly, why that is actually kind of a good thing. So before we dive in, let me just remind everybody who might be on Facebook to um, go to streamyard.com slash Facebook and give permission to show your name. It just takes a click. And this way, when you leave a comment, I know who's here. Hi, Mia. It's so good to see you here. And forgive me if I'm not pronouncing your name the way you like it pronounced. And welcome to Terry also. It's great to see some of our um, serious storytellers coming back for more discussion about story structure and writing craft. All right, let me just put this down for a sec. We don't need that anymore because you guys got it. This is such a great, um, it's such a great topic. Uh, let me just kind of give it a little bit of a, a context, right? So we're here to talk about a stage of the hero's journey, which is a set of metaphors about storytelling and story structure, um, codified by the scholar Joseph Campbell and then made, um, you know, different ways of talking about it, different ways of using it have become quite uh, popular among writers and for good reason too, because what Joseph Campbell was um, doing in his work as a mythologist was observing, not inventing, but observing that there are patterns of events and dynamics that seem to be common to stories told across culture and across history. And that there's something about these archetypal events, archetypal qualities of storytelling that, that seems to be, to, to be part of the human imprint, to be part of the human kind of relationship to stories. And that relationship is dates to antiquity. Um, I was having a wonderful conversation earlier today with the um, the kids who are members of my Swanburn Academy membership, which is a kind of a fun educational content membership for, for families. And we were talking about the constellations and the stories that people of from thousands of years ago looked up at the, at the incredible sky, saw the stars and saw pictures in them and saw stories in those pictures. The, the, the urge to make a narrative and to try to find meaning in our lives and the truth of our lives through storytelling is it's just deep. It's very deep in the human in human nature. So having given that as a bit of context, I um I work with the hero's journey in my own writing and in my teaching. And one of the stages of the hero's journey that happens um, uh, most significantly probably in the first act, but like all stages of the hero's journey, it's part of the cycle. It's part of the energetic cycle of storytelling that takes us through a whole narrative. Um, but this one ha is, has a very significant role to play in the first act, and it's called the refusal of the call, of the invitation, if you will. What is being refused? The adventure itself. It's as if you have gone to all the trouble of making a story for your hero, your protagonist, of inventing this fantastic, you know, plot that's going to fill up page after page after page of the book. And you bring your hero to the threshold of it and they say, but I don't want to do it, you know. Now, this, this is, you know, it's no hard feelings. We don't take it personally. The truth is that, that this is human nature, right? This is, like, this is accurate. It's truthful psychology. Most of us, so let's turn the observation back on ourselves for a minute. Most of us are not like automatically programmed to always do what is right for us every minute of the day, right? 
we are not like in a state of perfection. Most of us are not fully realized, you know, lacking all ambivalent, fearless, just, you know, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound. Like that's not who we are. That is a fantasy of, you know, the superhero who's just ready to always do the right thing. We are not that. Many of us strive for that. Many of us contemplate how we can get closer to that. But we mere mortals are in a state of becoming. We're, we're just trying to get closer to it. And so when we encounter an opportunity to level up, as the children say, as the gamers say, to do better, to move outside of a comfort zone that maybe we're stuck in, uh, to let go of a limiting belief, to stop playing small, you know, all those phrases that you come across in the personal development space, when we have an actual opportunity to, to move out of where we are and into, you know, where, where we, we ourselves may recognize we need to, to do better. We don't always embrace that opportunity. And just think about it for, logically for a minute. If we were so ready, if we were so a, uh, so resolved and clear, if we had such clarity within ourselves, we wouldn't be so stuck in the first place, right? So when we conceive of a hero of our story, one of the things that we're conceiving of is what are the ways in which they are embedded in a circumstance that's not the best? It's not ideal for them. This can have, you know, this can have a quality of, you know, maybe there's dysfunction or, you know, it's unhealthy or it's oppressive or it's just difficult, it's unstable. You know, we can put all kinds of descriptions around why the hero's world needs to change. It may be something as simple as it's time to grow up. The clock is ticking. We've talked about that. Um, but but then, then the adventure comes. Okay, here's your big chance. Here's your opportunity. You know, opportunity knocks. What do we do when opportunity knocks? Do we say, oh, thank goodness, I'm so, I've been waiting for you. Or do we go, ah, this is hard, complicated. I got to think about this. Am I worthy? Am I ready? What will people think of me? You know, uh, what if I fail? So all of a sudden, you know, when this opportunity comes to us, there's a lot of inner chatter that happens. Now, this is true of me. It's true of everyone I know who who's a person who has this inner life, who's not a two-dimensional cartoon character. Please feel free. Those I love seeing you guys making comments in the comments. Please feel free to resonate with any of that or add your own. It is, you know, it's just, it's just, it's just part of being a human being. If we were, if we were where the adventure is promising to take us already, we wouldn't need the adventure, right? And so there's that logical moment of resistance or of debate. Well, what, you know, how hard is this going to be? Well, can I do part of it and not all of it? Or can I have help? Like what if, you know, we, we, all of the things that might go through our minds, our heroes are no different. You know, our heroes are no different than that. And so when the adventure comes, there is this very, very uh, powerful stage of the journey called the refusal. And, and, and this is where we explore this very particular truth about, about being human. This to me is what stories do. They explore the truth of what it means to be human. They, you know, provide beautiful structured narrative containers so that our readers can go on this fantastic journey and identify with it feel akin to it, valid, it validates their experience, and maybe they too will learn something as they travel psychologically through the process of reading along with a hero who's going to encounter these truthful experiences, these moments of doubt. Um, so that <laughs> we've got a great comment. I got to put it up, Terry, because a lot of people are going to re recognize I'm writing a book and my kitchen has never been so clean. What a perfect example of the kind of creative 
procrastination that becomes like a self-imposed obstacle. Like the, the courage that it takes to sit down and say, hey, I've wanted to write this book for a long time. I didn't know how to begin. I didn't, I didn't think I was ready. I didn't think I had the ability. I didn't know if I had the talent. I like all of the obstacles. Think of all the obstacles that all of us have to get through to start writing those books, you know, when we're getting started out. And then immediately you, you're going to be in a tug of war with yourself. I want to do it, but I don't want to do it. I feel like doing it, but ah, there's a one dish in the sink. Let me go back and, you know, take care of that. Oops, there went my writing time, right? Love it, Terry. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so, uh, so, so this is normal. This is truthful. And the truth is what ends up in stories. So I want to talk about all the different ways that this refusal can manifest and why it actually deepens our storytelling. Now, Terry just like offered a great personal example. We can actually show our heroes, our protagonists, actively sabotaging themselves. We can show them saying, nope, 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 I don't want to do it. I'd rather not. Thank you, Gandalf, but no, this hobbit would much rather stay home where it's cozy and comfortable. Adventures are not for me. So that is, of course, an example from The Hobbit. It is a perfect example of a hero who has a comfort zone, who needs an adventure very badly because he is stuck on the inside, on a spiritual and psychological level. Bilbo is stuck. He doesn't quite know it consciously, but he is. It is clear that he is. The adventure of his life comes calling, and he says, ah, no, it's not what I do. Adventures are not my thing, Gandalf. Thank you. Good day. Good day, he says. What a dismissal. So you may have in your narrative a hero who says good day to the wizard who comes bearing his destiny, and he may say it, you know, a few times. That invitation is is destiny it's not really optional and so your hero it won't be able to wiggle out of it so easily so when they say no thank you i'd much rather stay home i'd much rather do the dishes i'd much rather do this stay where i am that invitation is only going to escalate it's just going to keep coming back there's a great example of course made beautifully visual in um, the film adaptation of the first Harry Potter book. So anybody out there who's a Harry Potter fan knows that when your letter from Hogwarts comes and an obstacle prevents you from reading it, it's that's not the only time it's going to come. It is going to keep coming and coming and coming and coming until it's going to fill the room like a tornado of letters. The adventure will not, in the end, allow itself to be refused. This example of Harry Potter and his letter to Hogwarts is an example of a different kind of refusal. This is a case. uh, So unlike Bilbo, Bilbo has a comfort zone. He likes his life very much. Thank you. And uh, even though it's probably not the best For him, ultimately, he really needs more. He has to express his inner nature more truthfully and more fully and not just succumb to being a conventional materialistic homebody hobbit. There's more to Mr. Baggins than that, as Gandalf says. And we can't leave parts of ourselves to wither on the vine. That's not good. That's not, that's, uh, that's what that, you know, what one of the things that that story is, is that if you, you can't decide, I'll be this part of myself, but I'm going to, keep all the rest of me locked away. That's not a healthy situation. It's like it's like putting a plant in the dark. It won't last long. So many stories uh, start from that type of dynamic. So Bilbo's comfortable. If you asked him, is everything okay? He would have said, of course, join me for a pipe. You know, everything's fine. If you asked Harry Potter, is everything okay? Well, what is the answer? No, things are terrible for him. Things are awful. He lives with a family who treat him very badly. He has to sleep in the cupboard under the stair. He's quite, you know, he's in that situation like Cinderella with the, you know, the family that has decided that he's sort of monstrous, you know, that he's, that he's repellent, that he's a problematic. Now, 
we all know, those of us who've read those stories, why the Dursleys are so upset. They know something about Harry that he doesn't quite know about himself, that he in fact has wizard capacities and they are determined to suppress them, right? So there we go, putting the plant in the dark again. It cannot happen. It won't last. It is a situation that is bound to you know, come to a head and, and be toppled over. So Harry himself doesn't have the clearest understanding of what uh, destiny has in store at the very beginning of that book, but he would never say, oh, my life is fine the way it is. He would desperately want it to change. So when that letter comes, the forces of refusal, this is very good storytelling, are not so much coming from the inside as they are coming from the outside. Now, there is a phrase for that. And once again, we have Joseph Campbell's work to thank. Threshold guardian. You know what a threshold is, right? It's like a door. We or or it's a symbolic crossing of one state into another. When when people get married, we talk about crossing the threshold, right? The bride crosses the threshold. Well, and so does the groom. So are they literally crossing the threshold through the walking into the door into their new home together? Yes, but it is symbolic. They are crossing a threshold from one phase of their lives into the next phase of their lives. So this is a, a reminder that we think of all of these terms symbolically, uh, not just literally. They may be literal. There may be ways that they become literal, but but the truth of them is always the symbolic truth. So. Poor Harry in Harry Potter books, the Dursleys are determined that he not get this letter. <clears throat> and they do a lot of different things to prevent him from getting it. So they stand in the way. They are guardians at the threshold and not in a positive way. They're not guarding uh, Harry for his own benefit. They are protecting that threshold. They don't want him to cross it. So any force any energetic force internally or externally that you can use in your storytelling that puts an obstacle between the hero and the adventure, the destiny that has come calling for them is an example of threshold guardian energy. So the refusal of the call, the refusal, the hero's refusal of the invitation to adventure and the idea of threshold guardian energy are linked. They work together. So your hero may be like Bilbo saying, oh, no, 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 I could never. I couldn't possibly. This is not what I want to do. Or your hero may be in a circumstance where when their destiny comes calling that outside forces have an agenda, have a reason, have a motive to prevent them from going on it. So those are two really interesting examples. Let me dig into a little bit more nuance now. Not every threshold guardian is like the Dursleys. Sometimes the threshold guardians in our lives are the people who want the best for us. Sometimes they are very well intended, but they themselves may quite innocently be in the normal human state of having limiting beliefs. You know, think of... Um, you know, I'll just make up a little example that's somewhat of a cliche. Perhaps you've got a person who's grown up in a small town and they've got dreams of, you know, attending a university abroad and living in a big city and having a very adventurous life. And, you know, the people in their hometown may very lovingly say, oh, no, no, don't leave. We love you here. This is where you belong. We, this is a beautiful place to be, you know, this is a great place to be. And they may try um, to, you know, dissuade, to not, to, to talk this person out of something that could be a big adventure, what they want to do, but they're not doing it because they're cruel or they're doing it because they are attached and because change is hard and everybody uh, has a tendency to resist change. You know, few of us are driven purely by the spirit of adventure. So that's a kind of threshold guardian energy that is quite effective in storytelling. Um, sometimes there is um, not so much of a refusal as a kind of an adventure that has a mind of its own. And my favorite example of that, of course, is the tornado that whisks Dorothy Gale 
from Kansas to Oz. Now, does Dorothy ask for a tornado to come? No, not really. You know, is this what carries her over the threshold to her big adventure? It absolutely is. Is it a very difficult crossing? Well, it certainly is. I mean, imagine being in a little house blown in a tornado. It's not calm. It's not an easy ride. So you can look at Dorothy's fear, Dorothy's confusion, Dorothy's, you know, need to just hang on and not know what's coming next. Those are sort of powerful refusals. She didn't ask for this to happen. It's just happening. It's just going, it's just there, you know. And then when she lands in Oz, of course, she can't help but be there. But the first thing she says is, I want to go home. So, you know, she is, in a sense, refusing the, the opportunity to be a citizen of Oz. But that's not what her adventure is, right? Her adventure is designed to solve the imbalance of her life in Kansas. Her life in Kansas wasn't going so well. She was lonely. Nobody had time to play with her. The mean neighbor wanted to take her dog away. It wasn't going so well. This adventure is actually designed to fix her life in Kansas, to make her, to, to get her sense of home in order. The whole theme of the movie is about Dorothy wanting to go home, but not to the home that's dysfunctional and not to the home that's lonely and where nobody has time for her and where people want to take her dog away, to go to the home where she belongs, you know, to go to a home where people remember that she's, you know, how loved she is and that she feels their love. And that is what that last scene in that movie is about. So tornadoes can be uh, can be helpers in getting heroes across the threshold, but it's still it's still this quality of being difficult, of not being, you know, what we what we want to do. Um, so let's. I'm going to look at some of these great. Oh, rosalyn has got a couple of great. Con comments. All right. This is a wonderful, this is actually leading me, Rosalind, to the next point that I want to make. So um, you're um, talking about the movie, The Last Star, The Last Starfighter. And in that film, the hero very clearly first refuses the call. And then you're comparing that to a new Netflix show called, called Kid Cosmic, where the hero jumps to answer the call, despite all his flaws. And one of his friends refuses it at first. So do you think it's important to show these variations? This is a great, it's a great observation, Roslyn. So let me just talk about this. The hero who refuses the call for reasons that we can, you know, we can relate to like Bilbo versus that hero in, uh, and the example that you're using is Kid Cosmic who jumps to answer the call despite all his flaws. So here's the thing. If you have the kind of hero who is impulsive and who is ready to do whatever madcap thing is asked of him um, or her, where is the threshold guardian energy coming from? Is it coming from external sources? Now, in the example you just shared, Rosalind, you say that the friend is the one who expresses the refusal. So that is an example of how, a, like a different way of handling it. So maybe the hero says, yeah, let's go, let's go get them. And the friend or the sidekick or the parents or, or other forces, as I was describing a couple minutes ago, other forces say, oh, no, 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 that's a bad idea. It's too dangerous. You know, don't do that. That is, you know, that's not what you don't have to do that. That's not your place or whatever. The point is that the energy is expressed. It, it is expressed in the storytelling. And why does this matter that it is expressed even if your hero has a kind of a gung-ho personality? It is expressed because the adventure must be difficult. If you give your hero an invitation to an adventure that actually... Uh, activates no resistance whatsoever from either the hero or their environment, then that adventure is not much of an adventure, is it? It's not really shocking anyone. It's not really taking your hero out of their comfort zone. And if it's not taking them out of their comfort zone, I have to ask what kind of journey of transformation is it going to deliver? If it suits who your hero is when we meet them at the beginning of the story, where's the transformation? 
The adventure has to be too hard. It has to be wildly difficult. It, it has to be implausible. It has to be something that your hero at the beginning of the tale has to kind of gulp and say, wow, that's way over my head. Because if it's not over their head, why are they doing it? Why is this a story? That's the question, Roslyn. The relationship between the difficulty of the adventure and who your hero is at the beginning of the tale and who they're going to transform into by the end of the tale gets expressed with tremendous power and clarity by the refusal. That's the key. That's why this stage of the journey is so important. It actually establishes the stakes of the story. So I got, you all must know the word stakes. What I mean by the word stakes is simply this. What happens if the hero fails? What happens if the hero succeeds? How serious are those consequences, right? If the hero succeeds, a family is reunited, a kingdom is, is, is brought back into peaceful harmony, and, you know, a war is ended. Those are pretty great outcomes. If your hero fails, or will they be killed? If Katniss fails in the Hunger Games, she's, she's dead. If Bilbo fails to charm the dragon at the Lonely Mountain, he will be dead. <laughs> you know, if, uh, if Dorothy fails to figure out how to get back home to Kansas, she will never see her home or family again. These are very serious consequences. Those are the stakes of the story. The stakes of a story almost always tend to be in the realm of life and death. And that's true even of stories that are not explicitly about combat or, you know, survival. There's some kind of life and death stakes, even if it's a kind of symbolic death of she'll never see her home and family again. That's that's a symbolic death. It's a it's a it's a permanent uh, breach. So establishing the stakes of your story is one of the jobs that the refusal of the call does and establishing the nature of your hero is the other you know in a sense more important job that the refusal of the job of, of the call does because when we hear somebody uh when we see a person confronted by their destiny how they react tells us everything about that person it tells us are they driven by fear what are their limiting beliefs why are they stuck you know, what's been going on? Who are they? What was the explanation for their life until this point? Why why have they ended up in this predicament? And then what is it going to take to get them to say yes? And so, um, and I'm going to bring Rosalind's follow-up comment on here too. So yes, you did notice that in Alice's farm, the main character, Alice, who is a rabbit, she she wants to answer the call. So she would she must get by the threshold guardians. She does, Rosalind. She absolutely does. I could talk about that in a minute. But what I want to emphasize is that your all of your heroes are going to accept the call to adventure adventure. They will all get by the threshold guardians. That's not the question. If they refuse the adventure, the book is over at the end of the first act. You know, if if Gandalf comes and says, Bilbo, I've got this great adventure. It's you, dwarves, there's gold, a dragon involved. You're going to love it. And Bilbo says, no, good day. And we close the book and go on. That's the end of it. Like it was 10 pages long. So you obviously your hero is going to find a way to get over it. And there is a way that they will get over it. But but I, before I go into detail about how they're going to accept the, the invitation to adventure, I just want to emphasize that this it's a temporary condition. The state of refusal, this debate about what you do is a temporary thing. It's part of the first act of your storytelling. And it if you skip it, if you are a storyteller who's impatient because you know that they're eventually going to say yes, and so you just get to that point, you know, you just go to that moment, you have missed an opportunity 
and you've missed the opportunity to let the reader have a glimpse of the true psychology of your hero. Now that is, uh, a, I mean, that's a big miss. Why not take that opportunity? Why not take that opportunity? Uh, the character that you describe, Roslyn, I'm going to go back to your earlier comment in, in, in Kid Cosmic. Uh, I don't know it, right? I don't know it. But a character who is so ready to do the thing, you have to ask yourself what journey of change they have to be on, right? It is a little, um, it, it's not perfectly useful sometimes to use television shows as examples because we don't have the access to the character's inner life that we do in fiction. And, um, you know, not that television and cinema is not storytelling. It absolutely is. But when I talk about examples, um, and obviously I use cinematic examples as well, but when I talk about examples from, for example, The Hobbit, you know, we have access to the inner life of a character in fiction the way we don't uh, quite in a television show. And we have more time. Even a very short and swift novel ha has more time than a, a, the script of a television show does. A television show is, is very swift and it has to hit all of its points very, very quickly. And it may in fact be driven more by the action than by character development. And so if a television show skips over any sense of refusal and gets right to the to showing its hero in the adventure, it's showing us a character who has a heroic quality in a classical sense, in a kind of a superhero sense. So I don't know if Kid Cosmic is that kind of show. I'll look into it, though. I'm glad you mentioned it. Um, but, a, but a hero who jumps into the adventure is displaying a different kind of, of issue sometimes. Um, they may be foolhardy. They may be impulsive. They may be grandiose, right? Like that you have to look then and say, well, okay, well, why didn't they pause for a minute to think, is this the right thing for me? Um, if they are desperate for escape, you know, then that is something that you, there's, there's all kinds of reasons. If you really think about it, why somebody might not hesitate to accept it, but it doesn't skip over the truth that this adventure is designed to transform them. And so the person who, even if the person says yes quickly, um, that in and of itself does, shouldn't indicate that the person is just completely without ambivalence or that they've got no limiting beliefs or that they've got no fears and hesitations. They may just be very skilled at hiding them. They may have a lot of bravado and that the unraveling of that bravado and that false front may be part of what the adventure is going to do for them. Does that make sense? So we have to look at it. Now, you mentioned Alice's farm, and I uh there actually is a passage in Alice's farm right before she accepts the adventure. Um it's a, a, it's a, a it's a whole scene um that culminates in Alice sort of volunteering to to go um be the one who goes to this new farm. It's not a new farm, excuse me. There, it's the farmers are new. It's been an abandoned farm, and new farmers have arrived on the premises. And the general consensus of this warren of rabbits who lives in across the meadow from this empty farmhouse is that not having farmers there makes life a lot safer. There are no farmers' dogs, for one thing. There's no farmer with a shotgun, you know, looking to keep the rabbits out. So it keeps life safer. But the, the counter argument is that without a farmer, there's no vegetable garden to raise. So it, life is safer, but it's also more dull and it's less rich. You know, there's no carrots, there's no radishes. There's, a, you know, they don't get to eat the incredible things that a, ra a clever cottontail can steal from a, a human's vegetable garden. So that those are kinds of the poles of values that are presented in that opening sequence, Rosalind that we can live safely with less risk, right? But life is a little boring 
or we can we can live in a state of greater risk and daring and have a richer and more exciting life. That's kind of the choice that Alice has to make before she's the one who decides that, you know, says, I will go and see what's going on down at the farm. I'll go check out these new farmers. She volunteers to do it, but there is a debate about it. And it's a whole scene and the scene acts upon her emotions um, so that she has to contemplate what might happen to her if she fails and what might happen to her if she succeeds. She evaluates what her resources are and she makes a decision that as a cotton, you know, a cottontail is a pretty vulnerable creature in nature. It's, it's, there's a, a million ways a wild rabbit can meet its end. And she contemplates that, but then she also remembers that she has all the benefits of being a cottontail too. She's got ears to hear with. She's got eyes that can see around her head. She's got strong legs for running away. She knows how to evade capture. And so she makes a decision, but there is a debate. So I, I uh, Rosalind, if you feel inclined to do so and you have a copy of the book at hand, go back and read that scene again. And you'll see that there's actually quite a bit of uh, toggling uh, within. And that a lot of, uh, of this threshold guardian energy is expressed by the other characters. It's a lot of it is expressed. So that is all, it's all quite there in the storytelling. So let's look at your next comment. Can the hero see a problem that they think has to be addressed or disaster will result? So they think they can't have the luxury of hesitating. They may still have fears about what they have to do. Well, you know, what is a hesitation, Rosalind? You know, is a hesitation a week or is a hesitation the flicker of a thought? Um, one of my, um, the, like if something is urgent, of course, someone who's in a kind of a heroic, heroic mode or has a kind of a latent heroic quality about them is, you know, we'll see that in their character that they will be the one to jump into the fray. Um, but that is that the totality of their character? I mean, do, do, do they jump into the fray and they succeed and then after they feel the fear afterwards, you know, it, it's, it's not a question of, um, let me just put this back up because I actually want to really look at how you word this. It's not a question of, can the hero do this? The hero can do it. You're, it's your, and this is another point I want to make. You are the boss of your story. I get this, um, comment sometimes from my students or this question of like, but my hero wants to do it. My hero wants to do it, they'll tell me, as if they're not making that decision. Like, you've decided that your hero wants to do it. And what I'm suggesting is that there is an opportunity in terms of storytelling energy, right? In terms of richness, in terms of creating a deeper bond between your reader and your protagonist. If you allow the refusal of the call, stage of the journey, to exist, to, to, to enrich the moment where your hero enters a new way of being, where they do something they've never done before, where they take on a challenge that a minute ago they would have thought themselves incapable of. Their whole lives are going to change. They cannot be the, the character who, who's so ready to say yes. If that character was completely ready to do that at the beginning of the story, this character doesn't seem to be in much need of spiritual transformation, right? So that, that lack of hesitation, that willingness to go do the thing, whatever it is, is an impulse. But it's not the truth of the whole story. It's what happens in that moment. But then what? The, the, the whole adventure still lies before them. That adventure, guess what? That's your second act. And it is made of obstacles. It is made of things that are very difficult for your hero. The obstacles at the beginning will be less difficult. The obstacles toward the end of the second act will be more difficult. Your hero needs to level up and level up and level up again. So it's very, very important that you take a moment as the, as the orchestrator of all of this, as the decider, as the boss of both your hero and their adventure, that you yourself understand why they need to change, what needs to happen. 
don't be so besotted with your protagonist at the beginning that you don't give them any flaws, limiting beliefs, weaknesses, hesitations, you know, that's not honest. Unless you're writing a superhero cartoon character and that you're just writing action-based adventures and they go, your hero is perfect and goes around saving the day and people are grateful. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. That is a different, you know, that's like a thin, a thin layer of storytelling. It still uses a lot of the, um, the same shape. It's still three acts and a lot of hero's journey stuff, but it doesn't have quite the depth that we want in fiction for sure. It doesn't have the same, um, you know, uh, commitment to taking a hero on a journey. When you take your hero on a journey that is truthful, psychologically truthful, you're also taking your reader on that same journey. Your reader will like it if it's truthful. If there's no emotional stuff in it, your reader is not going to have much to engage with. In the visual storytelling, comic books, TV shows, the reader can be very entertained by the visuals. We love visuals. We love things exploding. You know, we love all that action-packed stuff. There's any number of very commercial projects will tell you, you know, it's just the amazement of, oh, look, they blew that up, you know. But those stories are, you know, designed at, at a superficial level. They're designed to entertain and they're they're very, very enhanced by visual booming sound effects, the exciting music that gets your nervous system running, you know, the production values of television and film often leap into the fray to provide the emotional resonance and experience and the engagement of the reader that we fiction writers have the great privilege of doing artfully with language, with pure storytelling. You know, we have to create the special effects. We have to create that emotionally engaging musical score. We have to create the, uh, the, heart-rending close-up on the actor's face where we get to see their inner life. No words are required because we have good actors just carrying a lot of the work for us. But we have to do it with words. And um, and so what I encourage you all to do is to, is to look at your first act to understand what your hero's journey of change might be, whether they themselves understand it or not, whether they are conscious or unconscious of it. Um, and that, so that when the inventor comes calling, that, that it is something that gives them pause either internally or expressed externally or ideally both. And this is where the secondary cast of characters comes into play so beautifully. You know, your hero is going to be in a state of debate. In Alice's farm, uh, that scene that I described, Rosalind, the debate is largely internal within Alice to, before she makes a decision. But it is that internal debate, if you go back and look at the scene, is actually embedded as she is literally at a meeting of her Warren in which the debate about what to do is what either the action of the scene is. There is a debate about what they should do that is going on in this underground you know, room in the Warren Alice is at this meeting and she's listening to the debate and eventually just decides to participate in it. But things are said on both sides and she makes a decision within herself and then announces her decision. But it's all depicted. It is all part of the storytelling. If she was just so fearless and ready to do it, we readers would not have the opportunity to understand what is at stake for her. What a big risk she's taking. How unlikely it is that this extremely young rabbit, one of the youngest ones there, is the one who, who decides to go and the rest of them let her. It's quite, it all becomes quite richer and more, far more endearing. You know, we want to make our readers on the, t you know, we want to put them on Team Alice right away. We want to, we want our reader on Team Bilbo. We want them rooting for the main character. Well, what makes us root for someone? We root for someone when we're touched by their courage. It doesn't take courage to do things that don't frighten you. If it doesn't frighten you, it's just what you're doing next. It's the next thing on your to-do list. If it's frightening, if it's dangerous, if it's high stakes, if it's outside your comfort zone, then it takes courage. And when we see someone being brave, 
It brings tears to our eyes. It's so moving. So the moral of my story here today, my big message, you know, to you guys about this notion of the refusal of the call and the utility of the threshold guardian energy at this very key moment in the first act is that it is, it's based in emotional truth. It's based in psychological truth. It gives you the storyteller an opportunity to open up the truth of your hero to the reader, even if the hero themselves is not that clear about what their inner stuff might be. And it displays the stakes of the story. It gives an opportunity for the reader to fall in love with your hero because by showing them confronting uh, something that is outside their comfort zone and still being able to move forward into saying, okay, we see them being brave and right away we're rooting for them. Now I want to add one more thing before we, before we wrap up, what secret ingredient, like what changes between the moment when the hero might say, oh, I actually don't think I can to the moment when they say, okay, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a try. That is, um, there's something that shifts, right? It's almost like a little, a little drop of energy has been thrown onto the fire, right? It allows our hero to burn a little more brightly all of a sudden. And that energy comes from the mentor. Now, mentor energy is a whole wonderful topic, and we'll, we'll do another session just about mentor energy. But I just want you to know how, how important it is during the this refusal stage to counterbalance eventually the threshold guardian stuff that's going to be coming at your hero fast and furious with the the mentor energy the mentor energy is the one that says no there's more to mr baggins than you think there's more to him than he thinks there's more to him than, than at first realizes if you Look at poor Dorothy, who, who's swept away by this tornado and lands in Oz. Immediately, Glinda is there saying, no, no, here's what you must do. She provides valuable information. She calms Dorothy. She makes her confident, and she gives her the courage to do what must be done, which, as it turns out, is to travel this yellow brick road, go find this wizard, ask for his help. And by the way, there's going to be a witch who's very angry at you because alas, you've killed your sister. I mean, talk about, right, a threshold guardian, like that you've got a, you've just got into the world of adventure and you've got a big problem already. That's how a second act should begin. So all of this um, resistance, all this refusal, all this threshold guardian stuff, that what's the antidote? The mentor comes and the mentor, the mentor can just kind of shift the energy very, just with a touch. It doesn't take much. Remember that we are not trying to convert our hero in the first act to who they're going to be at the end of the book. We just need to move them a little bit. We need to move them from stuck to, okay, I'm on an adventure. From this world is not great to, okay, I'm going to give this new thing a try. It's a little bit of a movement, but I think as we all know, anybody who's try to undertake some new phase of life, some new commitment, some new journey of change, you know, where you really have to, you have to, you know, bet on yourself. You have to make a leap of faith in yourself that even that little movement from, I could never, it's been 40 years and I haven't yet. So I'm not going to start now to, well, okay, maybe I'm wrong about myself. Maybe everything that people told me about myself wasn't true. Maybe there's more to me than I realize. That's the mentor at work. You can bring that mentor energy into the story in a wide variety of ways, so we won't get started on that. But let's do that as another topic for another day. I think it's important. But it's very, very much a part of this, um, this quality that Rosalind describes so well. We've got the, we've got the, the hero in the refusal, but they must get over it, of course. They must or the story can't begin. Let me just see who else is, has a comment. Ah, Paul is here. Nice to see you, Paul. I'm going to just put this up so everyone can see it. Is it safe to say that the refusal of the call largely functions as a way to demonstrate that the character understands and fears 
the ramifications of their decisions and the stakes. That is safe to say, and, and I'll elaborate on it if you, if, you, if you permit me, Paul. The refusal of the call functions in a number of ways, and it does demonstrate the stakes of the story. Sometimes it demonstrates them to the reader, and sometimes it, it, it without the character fully getting it. Right. Which, you know, this is ultimately where we're going to end up and talk, all talk of writing craft is going to lead us, Paul, to the reader. What is the reader experiencing? We want our character to understand the stakes because that's what makes their moving forward an example of bravery. It, what's, it puts the reader on their side and um, understands and fears the ramifications of their decisions. Yeah, those are the stakes. So that is, that is one of the big functions. And I would also say, you know, let us not leave out that it is also true that this is, becomes a relatable thing that just kind of deepens the emotional and psychological truth of what's going on in your story. And it endears your character to the reader because we get to see them doing something hard and brave. And right away, we're like, oh, how is this going to go? You know, how is it? How is this going to work? Are they going to make it? Is Dorothy ever going to get home? Is Bilbo ever going to get to the Lonely Mountain? It, how is Harry Potter going to do at wizard school? Like, what's going to happen? What, like, we are engaged. We are emotionally engaged because of the state. The stakes have been demonstrated. An invulnerable hero can keep the can keep busy, but there's not really much emotional engagement because we just never are that worried about them, right? So. So that is a very good restatement, I think, of the case, Paul. Well done. You just say, oh, this is a lovely comment. I want to just end with this, Rosalind. Rosalind writes, I'm inspired by stories with heroes who have to face their inner issues, and I do hope that is in my own writing. I'm sure that it is, Rosalind, because you are a person with, a, with a, a, both a deep thinker and a big heart, which is the perfect combination of attributes for a good writer. I'm sure that it is. Those kinds of stories inspire me too, you know. And um, I think that Paul in, in uh, some previous live streams that we've done have has raised the question, or maybe it was in a comment you left me, Paul, about what are what about the stories in which our hero is is uh, like kind of on a backwards mission, like where they're they're kind of a jerk at the beginning, and they <laughs> they don't want to work on their inner issues, or it's a story where they refuse to work on their inner issues, and it has a tragic end, or it's an anti-hero story, like one of the many variations, right, of the hero's journey. Um, and those are all true, and we, you can, you can name and see examples of all of them. You know, any tragic story where you've got a character who's brought down uh, by ego, ambition, greed, right? You know, you can see that those those stories also follow the hero's journey. But we've what we've got is a hero who just refuses to learn their lesson, and those are those are fun to analyze. But I have to tell you, Rosalind, I think it's one of the reasons that I personally am drawn to writing. Um, what in the industry we call middle grade fiction and what I like to think of as just sort of books for all ages, right? Um, because we, because they don't shy away from this sort of redemptive quality of the hero's journey in which, in which a, a hero that we find compelling actually does go on a journey of transformation of consciousness, as Joseph Campbell calls it, through trials and revelations and comes out into a new state of being that is not only of benefit to them, um, it not only resolves their own situation, but actually brings them to a point where the resolution of their own uncomfortable beginnings is not is no longer the issue. The issue is what they're willing to sacrifice to make a larger positive impact. Um, and though that's you know that's the real structure of the hero's journey in a redemptive way that the hero does something very difficult and over the course of doing it comes to understand that it's not just about them, that there's more to this uh, journey than they first realized. And, um, and those stories are very inspiring indeed. Um, let me just go. Oh, we're going to take this as a, our last comment of today. Is it sometimes true that the character does not yet understand until they have found out what is really happening to them from embarking on the adventure? No, 
not sure I get, is it sometimes also true that the character does not yet understand until they have found out what is really happening to them from embarking on the adventure? I, I'm not entirely sure I understand this question exactly the way you mean it, Rosalind. I'll tell you what, um, quickly what I, uh, what I think you might be driving at. It's entirely possible that a story begins with a character or a hero who does not have really very much conscious uh, understanding at all of what their problems are, of what journey of transformation they need to take. Few of us do. Few of us do, right? I mean, few of us get up in the morning and say, oh, here's, unless we've had like too much therapy, right? You know, unless we've read too many self-help books, we've got a litany of this is wrong with me and this is wrong with me and this is wrong with me. And this is, these are the things I'm working on, you know? Um, some people have that uh, have that awareness. It doesn't mean that it fixes everything, though, does it? Making a list doesn't fix a thing. It actually requires action. It's much. It's a much deeper journey, right? So some characters won't have a list at all. They won't know. They will just be unconscious and just flailing about in their lives, and things are not good. And they may be missing key pieces of information. That's the other thing I suspect you might be driving at. Like Harry Potter doesn't know a thing about the truth of his parents, and um, you know, he doesn't really know the truth of it. He's going to find out, but the nature of his adventure is, is laid out in some specificity. It's not, here's a letter that arrives and says, here's your invitation to go on an adventure. I'm not going to tell you what it is. No, no, no. It's here. It is. You're 11 years old. It's the Hogwarts school. There's a place for you. These are the books you need to bring. It's extremely specific. And a really good invitation to adventure will often have this quality of being so specific. The invitation to adventure, the Gandalf and the dwarves present Bilbo, is utterly specific. Where are we going to Lonely Mountain? Who's going to be there? Smog the dragon. What's he doing? Sitting on our ancestral gold. What are we going to do? Bilbo, we're going to send you in and you're going to be the burglar and you're going to steal the gold back. What's going to happen if I succeed? you're going to get one thirteenth of the share of the gold. What happens if I fail? Well, having a failure in a conversation with a dragon, really, we don't need to say what's going to happen when you fail, right? It's that clear. And that clarity about the adventure is a place where many writers go wrong. They just think that they need to get their hero out of the first act and will figure out what happens to them after, later. I have to tell you, that you must resist the impulse to think that you can figure out the second act halfway through the second act. If the hero ends up crossing the threshold to adventure without knowing what the adventure is going to be, if you're in a situation where that seems like Dorothy in the tornado, where that seems like, well, no, that's how it's going to happen. You better reveal it in the first scene of the second act. Have Glinda come, lay it out. You know, you killed her sister. This is your enemy now. Here's your mission. Here's how you're going to get there. All of the specific, oh, by the way, here's what you're wearing. You got these ruby, ruby slippers. Do you see how many details the invitation to adventure contains? So either those details are provided in the end of the first act or they are provided in right in the beginning of the second act. And think again about refusing an adventure. Why would you refuse an adventure that you didn't know what it was? You know, like that those details give you lots of points of argument. <coughs> mm. Spring fever in February. Um, so those details are your friend as a storyteller. So don't so resist the urge to skip over all of that. Really think about it. When what's the second act going to be like? You can say it in a sentence, you know. Alice the rabbit is going to save the farm. That's what the second act is going to do. Bilbo is going to get to the Lonely Mountain and deal with the dragon, you know. Wilbur the pig is going to get to the date of the county fair and win the medal so that he doesn't get turned into bacon. It's one sentence. That second act is one sentence. And if you've got that sentence, you know, you can fill in quite a few details about it. Um, but you should, you should know by the end of the first act, what it's going to be, because that is the adventure. That's the story you're writing. That's the adventure that your heroes are being presented with, which they will have a reaction to. It's out of their league. 
whatever the adventure is, it's got to be like out, out of their league in order for them to really be challenged and changed by it. So I hope that this conversation has challenged and changed you. It is an honor to provide a little mentor energy to such a dedicated group of writers. I love that you guys come participate. These questions are fantastic and really enrich the discussion. So I'm very grateful for that. Um, please, if you're not already on my mailing list, sign up at www.pathofthestoryteller.com. Um, it's such a fun community and we've got good things in store, good, more trainings and stuff coming up soon. And uh, if you'd like to be part of the Facebook group, head on over to Facebook and find Path of the Storyteller there or subscribe to the YouTube channel and click the little bell so you always know what's coming up next. Um, thank you guys for your participation and I look forward to seeing you next time. In the meanwhile, be well and keep writing, okay? <laughs>